Yo, peace and light, family, abundance, manifestations, and gratitude. We out here this morning at the farm, and we just want to show y'all a little bit of what we got going on today. So today, uh, a rain, a nice rain came through. Actually, last night and for the past few days, it's been raining. And that has greatly benefited our system that we have going on. Y'all can see everything. This is what we're working on right now. It's still got a long way to go. We got that whole space back there. I don't think the whole area is gonna be covered in hay, but what y'all see is our market garden space. And we have our corn here looking pretty good. So just wanting to show y'all how this corn is looking. So we'll take a closer look at it, y'all. All right, so here we have our dent corn. We grew this corn because it's meant to create meal. And in the wake of COVID-19, we want to begin to establish more resilience by growing value-added crops. So dead corn is a type of corn that you would allow to dry. And that way you would then mill it and you got your corn meal. I don't know if y'all know about them grits out there. I don't know if y'all like y'all grits with sugar, if y'all like it with salt. Let me know in the comments below. But aside from that, dead corn is just a great corn to grow. Sweet corn is a common, which I find at the stores mostly, um, at the farmer's markets. But we didn't want to grow sweet corn this year because basically sweet corn takes up a lot of nutrients and it take up space. And with that space, I want to make sure I get some seed out of it. So everything I'm growing out here, I want to be able to uh, sell as something that I can propagate or something that I can uh, have a value added product from. So our dent corn is doing pretty well. We gave it uh, one teaspoon of azomite each and some compost. And um, that's about it. We probably, we might mineralize here. I, I think actually we did some blood meal. That's what it was. So they, they definitely got a, a nitrogen feeding when we first established them about I think we did this about a month ago. So it's just it just rained. The fertilizer that we put on, it's not water soluble. It um, breaks down through organic matter. So the bacteria had to get to it. And But we do think that the rain helps. So the corn's looking pretty good and I can't wait. We also got some sorghum that we about to plant as well. All right, y'all, so this is our sorghum. Sorghum is pretty much, it is a grain, it's used to make syrup. It's a sugary grain, just like corn and sugar cane. And it's kind of a mixture between corn and sugar cane. Sorghum, you can eat it in, in your rice. It cooks just like rice, like brown rice, not uh, black or wild rice, but it cooks like brown rice, where you can boil it for a little bit and then you be done and ready to cook in about 30 minutes. So we like to mix sorghum in our rice. We also wanted this for uh, caning so that we can like juice it and see uh, what comes out of this product. Of course, we're gonna save some of that seed, but this is some type of Mennonite variety. Shout out to the Mennonites out there holding down the sorghum game. But we got these off of Baker's Creek. So y'all make sure y'all check them out. But yeah, we planning that today. And this is pretty much our grass area. So I just wanted to, it's kind of experimental. This year we're not growing it to, to sell. We're really growing it to see how it does in this space and to hold the seeds. And then over here, we got our teff. That's our premier grain this year. This is an Ethiopian grain. Uh, it's from Africa and you I got I actually got this from the store some I purchased some store-bought organic non-gmo uh, Teff which is not actually available anymore. I come to find out but I purchased some I'm glad I did when I when I saw it I Experimented to see if it would grow and here it is growing right now y'all So as y'all can see it's doing pretty well. They say Teff is used to 
be grown in like drought conditions. Uh, and here in our zone 8B climate in the Southeast US, we are expecting me being not a conspiracy or anything like that, but me being cautious. I, I prepare for droughts and I prepare for heavy rains. And that's what this hay that we spread around our space is doing. You lay your carbon down, it absorbs moisture and it retains moisture in times of drought. But we also accompany that effort by planting drought resistant crops. So that's what this TEF is. I'm eager to see how it's gonna look in the middle of the summer. I'm also eager to get some grain from it. They say TEF is, I believe, the smallest grain in the world. So it's used to make injera bread, just all around good grain to grow. It's high in protein, it's gluten free, it's just a pretty good grain to have. So I'm excited about that. So we got our teff and then our last crop. So we just showed y'all our corn. We just showed y'all our sorghum. We showed y'all our teff. And we got one more crop that we're planting today and that I'm eager to show you guys. And that is our upland rice, y'all. So here is upland rice. Most people are used to seeing, including myself, most people are used to seeing rice grown in paddy fields, but this type of rice, hence the name upland, can be grown in areas of low moisture retention. I didn't have access to paddy fields and I didn't feel like going through the process of making that. So instead I grew some upland rice and I am glad to know that it is doing well, especially with the recent rain that we had. So we planted this about a month ago as well. I started all of these from transplants as a seed. I started them as transplants, and when they were about uh, three weeks old, I took them out. Uh, yeah, about three to four weeks old, I took them out and I planted them out here. So these started off as seeds in the greenhouse. So we got some more rice that we're gonna plant today, some baby rice. Really, it's like only a few, like only, only about 10 rice grains, and I'm gonna be continuously planting these throughout the summer, but I'm glad that we do have these grains. This is definitely a fun experiment. They say that grasses take up a lot of nutrients in the soil, so they are heavy feeders. They like moisture or they appreciate moisture, but they also help retain moisture through their root systems and they help keep your soil intact. So feeding them is a small payment for that effort. So this is the grassy area that we got going on. And we're gonna get it popping. We also got the buckwheat. So the buckwheat is another cool, fun crop to grow. The bees love it. It blooms in eight weeks. It gives back to the soil. They say that buckwheat has the potential to uptake calcium and give it back to plants. So it's a great chopping job if you have uh, fruiting plants this summer. All right, y'all. Just wanting to share that with y'all, show y'all what we got going on. It's all about the grasses. We also have peas that we intercropped as well in our space and that we're gonna continue to do. This year, we're doing a lot of white acre peas. A lot of people have been asking for that, so that's what we're gonna see how it, how it plants. What else did we have? Black eyed peas. We had uh, calypso uh, peas. We have black beans. We have uh, chickpeas. Let me take y'all to the chickpeas real quick. We also have hyacinth bean. So, I don't know if y'all can see that. These are our chickpeas. These, again, are store-bought. All of this stuff is organic, non-GMO, but these are store-bought chickpeas, and they are doing pretty well. Chickpeas are one of my favorite beans to eat. And um, in this experimental plot, I wanted to see how they do. And if I could get more beans back than I grew, that's a great uh, investment to me. I'll replant those again next year and um, I'll probably grow more chickpeas. I got more of the seeds that I saved, but um, it's for me, I love getting non-GMO things from the store, organic seeds, trying them out. So that's a fun experiment and uh, seeing if they grow or not. A lot of seeds, a lot of things, turmeric, ginger, and just seeds in general are often radiated when they're not genetically modified, when they're not certified organic, and when they come from outside of the US or outside of your country. Because I can't say 
I know that other countries practice organic uh, growing, but I know that oftentimes in mainstream stores, you have access to more than just organic. You have access to non-organic. To me, it's all a preference, but as a grower, I like to look for the highest quality of seed. And for me, that comes in the trueness to its genetics. Now, and then hybridization is a whole nother topic, which I advocate a little bit more for than I do genetically modifying things. But that allow we going on the tangent. The point is the seeds that I grow are certified and they are producing and I'm happy. So I hope to keep y'all updated with what we got going on. Thank y'all for supporting us along the way. We love that we got some rain. Y'all stay tuned for more. Store that carbon. And as always, thank you for being smarter by nature. Peace.